Hi, and welcome to another episode of Cast from BI. Today, I'm excited that we're going to talk to Rob Colley. And Rob Colley has been in the industry for a long time. You probably know him from his podcasts, from his books, from his amazing blog uh, that probably most of us got started through, um, from his sessions, and obviously these days as a successful owner of a consultancy firm on self-service BI Power Pivot. So today we're going to talk about all these things. We're going to talk to about the foundation of Power Pivot, the idea of self-service BI. Rob was there at the beginning at Microsoft to evolving into a consulting firm and having to work with customers and figuring out how to run self-service in their organization, how to let people use the data and how to work with this and how to get customers to be on board on this journey. So with that, let's go to the episode and listen to Rob. Let's go. So I'm super honored to have you here. It's great to see you after, I don't know how long, it's been a long time since we actually saw each other. I think we bumped into, into each other in Redmond when you were somewhere else and we passed yeah. in the hallway and saw you for like <laughs> Completely five accidentally. Completely yeah. accidentally. When I didn't even know you were... I didn't even know you were back in Seattle on the on a visit at that time. And I just go walking around the corner and there you are. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. Yes. I do miss going back to Redmond too, by the way, at this moment in time. But yeah. One more one I bet. time. I bet. Well, we can all go back to traveling. It, it'll happen. It'll definitely happen. <laughs> so so great to have you. So maybe a quick introduction, who you are, what you do, your company. Yep. All right. So uh I'm Rob Colley. I uh um, CEO and founder of a company that's now called P3 Adaptive. Some of us knew, you know, some of you might have known us as Power Pivot Pro over the years. I mean, that was that was just the name that I gave a blog in 2009, um, and uh, you know, so we've we've grown up a bit since then. So P3 Adaptive is is who we are these days. I think that 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 fits us pretty well, um, you know. And as you know, uh, I was uh, also an ex software engineer, you know, engineering leader at Microsoft for. A number of years straight out of college, uh, you actually took my chair. Exactly. Uh, you know the the head count that I opened up when I when I left uh, didn't didn't stay open for very long. You know the, the this mean mean Dutchman uh, decided to <laughs> I think to I step mean, in and take that. It's still an amazing story, but uh, I think uh, we were like at least it always feels to me like Twitter and blogging and that's how we got to meet each other and. Yeah, yeah, that's how it started for me at Microsoft, and uh, it's, I never imagined that I would be at Microsoft, working at Microsoft, and things like this. Yeah, it's the it's one of those you know internet only relationships, internet only friendships, right? That that then actually turned out to have some real real world implications. You know, yeah. <laughs> it led it led to some changes in your in your actual physical location on the earth, uh, yes. and. Uh, and I think it that that worked out very well for you. So I'm still um, here. Yeah, eleven. It's almost <laughs> eleven years. <laughs> almost eleven years. Oh my gosh, that's right. It was. It was like spring of 2010 when you were kind of yeah. coming to this conclusion that maybe you should be, you know, taking that leap. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe I mean wow. I mean we can we step the hat. But like maybe also a little bit of your origin story. So uh, yeah, straight out of uh, what we call college, and um, yeah, very strange and interesting place to to finish growing up uh, is Microsoft, you know. Um, and so that was 1996, and um, I did some, you know, it was a winding path at Microsoft. Like my first, my first real sort of intensive job was I was the uh, the loan program manager on the Windows installer, the, the, you know, the first version of the MSI setup technology, which, um, you know, is still used, you know, by everyone, like just you ubiquitously today, right? It's just everywhere. Yeah. Um, and yet it was like one of the least glamorous, <laughs> the least glamorous jobs you could ever have, you know, uh, it, it did get me, you know, really, really acclimated right from the get go, though, to sort of the problems of IT. You know, like mm -hmm. I, I, it allowed me to, you know, it gave me a lens of sympathy to um, what IT leaders are up against. And, you know, there was a, a huge, a huge project and it was, it was very successful uh, in a subtle and broad way. 
Um, but again, like, uh, this is not what careers are made of at Microsoft, you know, like it's, it's one of those jobs, just like it, right. It was one of those jobs where we were only noticed when we did something wrong. Mm. Like when you're, when you're the setup architect, you're the installation architect, like when, when it goes smoothly, no one comes and pats you on the back. It's, it's the, no one appreciates how hard that was, you know, it's just doing what you're supposed to, right? Even though it was ridiculously challenging and super complicated and unforgiving. Um, but when, for instance, uh, an intermediate version of your installer uh, gets deployed within the office division and it, it blue screens, it deletes DLLs on accident from Windows. Again, this was an intermediate build, right? But it literally <laughs> just wiped out the Windows installs of like every developer uh -huh. in the office org. Like like over a weekend, um, you know, you get noticed. <laughs> yeah, you get noticed in all the wrong ways uh, for that. So again, you know, kind of it gave me my IT hat, uh, and I'm, I'm I'm grateful for that. And I bounced around some more after that. I worked on some just within the office org, which is where the believe it or not, the installer was originally built by the office team, and then we gave it to Windows. I didn't go to Windows. I stayed in Office, and um, I do remember at one point. Um, having a conversation with the manager, a potential hiring manager within office. And they were recommending places that I might work within office next. Huh. And they, they suggested Excel. And I was like, I will never go to work on something like Excel. Like, come on, like that's boring. Like, stuff. As if it was like, as if it was, it was like beneath me, I was such an arrogant and, you know, just like, oh, so naive. Uh, and, um, but you know that the gravity of Excel was strong. It eventually, it eventually reeled me in, even by like just like fate. Like I almost, in a way, got reorged uh, huh. into Excel, and um, and I stuck because I I was also in, really really into uh, uh, fantasy football at the time, and Excel was my had become my like competitive weapon in in that hobby that I had, and uh, it was so I weird. Remember that the I, power I, pivot I, models, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's it's remained a a hobby even to this day. Um, you know, we've even on our podcast we've had on some fantasy football analysts, right? Like, because it's just like it's just an so actual footballer to too. Still. Actual, yeah. Like we had a, a an ex NFL quarterback who. Yeah, I love that um, podcast. It was really good. Yeah, he's uh, Hugh Mellon. He, yeah, the the you know for for you know the listeners of your show the the most arguably the most impressive spreadsheet I have ever seen in my entire life was built by an ex NFL quarterback and not like a third stringer that never saw the field. I mean, this was a, you know, a star of his era, <laughs> you know, it's like, dang, like, uh, it's not fair that someone can be that talented in, in that many different <laughs> domains, you know? Um, but yeah, so Excel became a real, you know, like that was sort of like the first thing that I, again, ironically, I ended up really loving working. I loved working on uh, Excel. It was awesome. And um, the 2007 release of Excel was really, really crucial because that's when um, sort of like the, the management team on the, you know, above me, like the, the VP level at, at Microsoft um, at, on Excel decided that Excel needed to get on board with this business intelligence revolution. Mm. Uh, and you know, it's hard to imagine this, but at the time, you know, and again, 2007 release of Excel came out in like 2006, but that is, we started it in like 2003, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to imagine, but the, the term business intelligence was hot. That was a hot new term then, at least to me, like it sounded amazing, like, like so compelling, you know? And for some reason, they, they decided that I, Rob Colley, should be in charge of the business intelligence related features in Excel. Uh, and I was just like, okay, well, what is, then my next question was, what is business intelligence uh, other than this really exciting new term? Uh, and what business intelligence turned out to be for that release was really getting to know the analysis services team. You know, like I met, I met, you know, some of the, you know, the the familiar names of today. You know, I, I worked with uh, with both of the Nets brothers, actually Amir and Ariel. I worked with uh, a little bit with Christian, uh, with Marius. You know, 
Um, yeah, and they're all still around, so that's pretty amazing. Yep. Yeah. And those relationships, of course, became, you know, really valuable in a subsequent chapter. <laughs> you know? um, but yeah, the, the Microsoft at the time, it decided that Excel, I mean, you know, completely naturally, like that Excel should be a first rate front end for the back end BI technology that Microsoft was already, you know, so, so good at like analysis services was uh, even at the time was the had the largest, you know, the single largest market share of um, of OLAP products mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on the market. And of course, the, there was no front end from Microsoft. It was all it was all partners, you know, uh, you know, third party, you know, visualization and reporting layers that would it would you, you have to buy with um, analysis services. There was no single Microsoft, you know, sort of single vendor Microsoft solution for analysis services, which is when you think about it, you look back, it's like, it's kind of jaw dropping, right? That we were ever in that spot that, yeah. you know, the, the beautiful analysis services engine, you, you, you needed to buy that. And then you, then you needed to go to someone else and buy a visualization layer, <laughs> you know, an exploration nope. layer, like a UI. So, uh, this is when Pivot Table started. For you? <laughs> well, unfortunately, well, for me, yeah. I mean, like, there's another sort of like kind of funny thing about Microsoft is that, like, in, in the course of my time at Microsoft, I met like five different people who all claimed to have invented Pivot Tables, you know, and they never, they never told me, they never, they would never say, you know, I'm one of the inventors of Pivot Tables, right? They would always say mm -hmm. something, you know, like, I, invented pivot tables or I'm the inventor of pivot tables that I'd, I'd be like in the back of my head comparing notes and saying, this is like the fifth person who's told me this. It's, Someone it's must have true. the patent, no? Well, I'm sure there's a bunch of people listed on that patent um, if we looked it up. And of course, you know, I mean, and then, you know, if you, if you really go back into history, like, you know, Lotus will claim that the improv, Lotus improv was the was the inventor of pivot tables and then pivot tables is just a different name. I don't know. It doesn't matter. I mean, mm -hmm. pivot tables existed long before I got there. Um, and, uh, but they weren't a particularly great interface for analysis services. And so a, a big part of our focus in 2007 was making pivot tables a better interface for analysis services. And, 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 you know, and analysis services was adding a bunch of new capabilities and APIs and, and things like that, that, um, uh, you know, that made it possible for office and, and other applications as well to do better <laughs> at being a yeah. front end. And so it was sort of a two way evolution, you know, Amir and I would sit down sometimes and hatch some collaborative ideas like, okay, if analysis services does this, then Excel can do that. Sometimes those were good ideas. Sometimes they weren't so good. Um, a number of them of both flavors made it into the product. Um, and what I always feel, you know, it, it's super important to note that like I was, I was, uh, the leader of a team, uh, on the Excel side and the members of that team really did the majority of the work. I mean, I get like, you know, it's, it'd be such a, um, you know, a dishonesty by omission for me to pretend that like, like I did all of those things. I mean, the, the team that, that was working with me was just insanely good. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, some of them, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Howie, Howie Dickerman and Alan Fulting, right? Like, I mean, like strong, strong people. Uh, so oftentimes you're just like, how do you get out of their way? How do you support them and get out of their way? And uh, so it was really, it was a really cool, cool experience. Um, but then yeah, something, something strange happened. Microsoft decided that Microsoft itself was going to get into the fantasy sports business. And, you know, it was like, oh, that's Rob Colley's music, you know? <laughs> like, and so uh, I, I kind of like, in some people's eyes, I threw it all away. I had risen to a position of prominence in the Excel team. And, uh, and I chose to go to work on this silly thing uh over like on the msn and windows live side of the house fantasy football and uh you know and i said well but this is this is my thing you know i've got to go do it and you know they were they were 
at least temporarily proven correct. So after about six months, uh, Microsoft canceled that fantasy football project. <laughs> and now I was without a home and I got, I got reorged into Bing. It wasn't even called Bing yet, but that's what I, that's what I got reorged into. Uh, I did not enjoy working on Bing. Mm. Uh, it was just, you know, especially at the time. And I think even to this day, like, a product like Bing, a service like Bing, is like 99.9% .9 algorithms and you know 0.1% uh, user experience. Um, and there just wasn't there just wasn't a lot for someone like me to do. Um, and uh, it was it was really, you know, you get in those places where like you're you're getting paid, but you still don't feel like you're doing anything, and like you you. Some people might think that's like a dream, but mm -mm. it's one of the most stressful places that you can be. I think mm -hmm. for most people is like just feeling useless every day. Um, and about that time when I was coming to the conclusion after about a year of that, that, that no, I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. Amir came knocking and said, Hey, why don't you come check out this thing we've got going on over here? I think you might, you might enjoy working on this and we call it project Gemini and uh, I'm like, okay, I'll come look at it. And I went and looked at it. I'm like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> I'll be right over. And uh, so that's how I got, I got, uh, I got started with the power pivot thing. Yeah. And that's really right. Because I mean, you, so you start to get into the data really with the fantasy football, right? That's where you get like, mm -hmm really started with the data and then in power pivot, I mean, yeah, the things you can start now to do. It's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it's yeah. And you know, there's, you know, there's, there's something really, um, you know, really interesting about, uh, uh, and it's just, it's just good luck. It's, it's about my career is that, uh, I don't think many people have both sort of have these have these four types of experience that my my random career just happened to expose me to. So there's, you know, I both I, I built spreadsheet software on the Excel team. And I used spreadsheet software like I was a real heavy duty user of it. And I was on the software engineering team. And right off the bat, most software engineers don't get to also become really heavy duty users of their own product. Yeah. It's ironic, but that doesn't, that's, that's an exception rather than the norm. So I had both of those. I also then on the power pivot team and really part of the Excel experience as well, working with the BI crew, I helped build BI software. Uh, but then there's a crucial fourth piece that was the luckiest of all, which is during that six months, that glorious six months where I, I thought fantasy football at Microsoft was going to be a thing. We were going to have a, a site and a service and people would be playing fantasy football on the Microsoft platform instead of the Yahoo platform and all of that, or ESPN. Uh, I, uh, I, I talked the powers that be into, we should do an amazing statistics portal as a differentiator for our fledgling service. And Microsoft has the platform to do this. We will use Excel services from 2007, uh, the web version of Excel as a front end over the top of analysis services. And we'll yeah. load the analysis services cube, the, the data model with the most detailed data we can get our hands on. So we, we spent a lot of money. Uh, we spent a lot of money on the raw data uh, from like the like stats incorporated stats LLC. Um, and then we also, this is the crucial part. We also paid an outside consulting firm to come in and build the cube for us. So they built all the ETL, you know, the SSIS packages, then they built the cube itself, wrote all the MDX formulas. And, and we needed this because even though I had worked closely with those teams, I had never been able to learn. Uh, or, you know, some combination of interested enough and capable enough <laughs> of learning, yeah, learning MDX, certainly never learned SSIS, right? Um, and um, so I got to be a stakeholder 
like the project sponsor mm. for a real BI project, not just an end user of the thing that came out of it, but I got to be like the person who was signing the check essentially and providing the specifications, providing the requirements and all of that. And it was a real lucky, lucky thing that I got to eat my own dog food there. Uh, and remember, this is this is before Power Pivot. This is before Power BI. This is the original. You know, this is like the the Microsoft BI stack, yeah. circa two thousand seven. And um, you know that project didn't go as quickly or as well as I anticipated. Uh, and so I got to learn a lot of really really important things about the BI industry that uh, I didn't really expect. And those, those, those became super relevant later. Um, but, uh, but then there was a, that, that power pivot phase was really, really fascinating. Um, I think we, we probably want to talk a little bit about the, before we jump past, we probably want to talk a little bit about what it was like, you know, uh, on that team. Cause that was, a, that was a really yeah, interesting. That's era. where it all started. And this is where most of the people watching this show today, I mean, they work with every day, not yeah, necessarily yeah. power pivot, I, but. It all comes from it. Yeah. Like it was um, like, you know, the the analysis services team, which was, you know, the, the team that was building Power Pivot and therefore building, you know, the, the Vertipak engine and building the DAX engine and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, these are all server side engineers. And so I was there sort of like, uh, almost like in like the Lorax, like I speak for the trees sort of thing, like for, uh -huh. by Dr. Seuss, like I was there to like speak for the Excel user and the Excel user was absolutely, you know, the Excel power user was the target for power pivot. And so like I was there to represent that. And originally, um, uh, you know, Amir's idea was that I would be, uh, heavily involved in the formula language and the formula language at the time was just internally codenamed. This is really interesting. Was codenamed seal. Did you ever hear that term seal? Yeah. S E E L. S E E L. Yeah. Server yeah. engine expression language or something like that. Right. Um, and, uh, which sort of, it really sort of tells something important about DAX's origin. This is what ultimately became DAX, right? Is that, you know, certain parts of the evaluation were going to be built into the storage layer rather than everything operating like at a distance in the formula, right? In the formula engine. And this is one of the, you know, not the only by far, but, it, but it's certainly one of the key innovations of, of DAX and, and Power BI is just how stinking fast it can be. <laughs> it can yeah. be ridiculously fast against, you know, just ungodly volumes of data. And, um, so I remember Amir and I spent long stretches, uh, like in his office or in my office, usually in his, and um, and we spent long stretches doing it wrong. Uh, like we were doing it at the pivot table layer. There's a there's a lot of talk lately, or has been over like the past like eighteen months about you know potentially introducing um, an additional type of calculation to Power BI that happens within the visual, and not you know, behind the scenes, um, you know, like, Hey, look, the grand total is right there. Why can't I just say, you know, like reference that instead of like having to use the all function to strip off a bunch of filters. Right. Um, well, that's how we started. We started trying to design, design a, a language, an expression language at the visual layer. And that was sort of at my, you know, running on my instinct. Mm. And it's kind of amazing that a mirror, uh, trusted that instinct at all. Um, because, you know, I mean, I, I think it was probably necessary for him to go down that route with me to discover that it doesn't work. Uh, now, not to say that there can't be a visual level expression language that can be added, you know, sort of side by side with DAX, but you mm -hmm. could never build something comprehensive at the visual layer. And we had to dig at that for several months, I think, before we kept, you know, sort of just like face planting into the wall. Um, now, around the same time where I was saying to myself, like, yeah, I just I don't we're not really making a whole lot of progress on this formula language. And at the same time, I was looking over 
over my shoulder at what was going on in the UI team of Power Pivot. Um, and, you know, it's, I guess it's really natural looking back that like, when you when you're a server engine team with a long server engine, you know, legacy, and no, at the time, zero user experience, uh, engineering, right, never done anything like that, really. I mean, I guess Visual you can count, Studio like, doesn't count. No, yeah, no, I don't think Visual Studio. The, the no. multidimensional wizard. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't count it in the same way. So, but, but I guess it's really natural for that sort of a team to think: if we bring in the Excel person, we should have them working on the expression language, right? Like the mm. you know, like this Formula. this really intensive, like you know, part of our server engine, you know. And really, I kept looking over at the add-in, the thing that you know, the user interface that was being you know imagined for the Excel user and, and going, oh, this isn't going to work for the Excel user. What the, the, they're not on a path that's that's going to do that. And so like, I kind of like voluntarily or like kind of forced my way out of the formula language story and, and went over to to start helping the UI experience. And, um, you know, at the time, I think that probably, I mean, it was, I think it was necessary for the product, but uh, I don't think it was good for my career <laughs> at the time because I, you know, today, today's team, you know, the Power BI team of today is so much different. Like they absolutely know that they're a user experience team now, you know, they, they get that. Like that's a, that's a transition that, you know, that, that, that they completed going through years ago. Um, but I think at the time it was sort of like, oh, you want to, you want to go work on the pixels? Like, why would you, why would you want to do that? You know? uh, so, and then Howie came over. Oh, uh, yes. So then we had two Excel reps and Howie, plus the accrued wisdom of having failed at the visual level led to a very, you know, to the DAX that we have today, which is defined in terms of the source tables, like the visual uh, that the user is working with has nothing to do with the calculation. And you know, I think that was absolutely the right decision. Um, you know, it has, it is a ridiculously comprehensive language. It's unbelievable oh, yeah. how, how amazing DAX is, you know? And, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, some people, you know, I mean, a lot of people, even myself, sometimes I'm like, oh, come on, like, do I really got to go write the thing with the alls to get to the grand total? <laughs> yes. I get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, I think it's gone. Like, I, I don't, I, even I don't do that much DAX anymore these days. But when I look at it, it's so different now than it was. Yeah. Five, yeah. ten years I mean, ago. You know, you were just talking about the DAX language itself, right? Yeah. You know, I think it's both that a lot of, um, you know, a lot of new capabilities have been added to DAX, but there's also just sort of like, um, like the, the serious sort of high end people have, have gravitated towards it, which in the early days they weren't. Um, and so you end up with, like, I look at DAX formulas now that are like, oh, that are on the internet and I go, I'm like, I, I have, they, they they actually like have like this like reverse gravity to them to me. I'm like, Ugh, I don't want anything to do with that, right? Like, whereas the formulas that that I learned to write and the the style of formula that I would write, it's almost like a it's almost like a dialect of a language, right? Like my dialect of DAX, uh, you know, I think is you know, it's just so much simpler than you know, these, these things that almost look like SQL queries, uh, in a way, right? Like a, like it's, it's hard to even put together, like in this multi-paragraph DAX formula that you see, like wh what it's even doing, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's super high performance, you know, it's gonna, on large data sets and complex situations, it's gonna run circles performance wise around like the dialect of DAX that I was writing in the early 2010s and everything. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I'm not, it's not sour grapes. It's just that, um, in a way, I think the, the dialects of DAX that have become dominant 
like in the community are um, like end up being a sort of accidental gatekeeping. They, 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 you, a lot of people are getting are getting more scared of DAX than they need to be. Like that 100 level of DAX formula is actually much, much, much easier to write, much, much easier to understand. And, you know, in like 95 plus percent of circumstances, it's just as good. It's not, it's not noticeably any worse. Yeah. And um, it's for those so, people who just whip them on some data in Power BI desktop and yeah, go at it. Yeah. And they don't need but, all but, the complex variables. That's right. And, that's right. And columns. then, then, but you know, imagine what it's like being, and like, I think that I today, if I were just becoming a user of DAX today or, or evaluating whether I wanted to be a user of DAX today, if I started Googling around, you know, looking for examples and help, I mean, the DAX that I find on the internet today would absolutely scare me off. Mm. I would want nothing to do with it. Like it would terrify me, you know? Um, whereas, you know, those, those old formulas that I was writing, you know, like the simple calculates and like, and learning to introduce filter, which isn't even necessary anymore in many cases, which is crazy. Uh, like, um, like that's, that's so much more approachable. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I think some of the excellence in the, the DAX community is, is I think contributing to this notion that DAX is hard. Um, because it isn't that hard. It isn't as hard as people think it is. I mean, the way I see and, it uh, is because a lot of people, they start thinking about how to structure the data after the fact. And yeah. That's, that's usually what I say. They, they try to get their way out of it by doing DAX gymnastics and then things yeah. get really hard and I agree. unnecessarily I agree. hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the one wide Franken table urge yep. that is taught by both traditional Excel and by tools like Tableau. Uh, you know, a lot of people come to the Power BI table with exactly that mindset, you yes. know? Um, and, you know, um, like it, in a lot of cases, it does think, make things more complicated, but in other, in other cases, it's also just like, if you approach things that way, you're missing so many capabilities that you wouldn't have even thought about, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember, um, when I was working on Excel 2007, um, going on this really expensive business trip, um, to visit a whole bunch of customers in Europe. And we, we visited one customer in, um, in the UK and they told us, Hey, you know, we have like, this is again, old analysis services. They said, you know, we've sort of settled down on a model of, um, the way that we approach things is we just, we build one cube per report. Oh, wow. And, and I didn't even know, and this was a really big organization. This is a monstrous organization. And this was like a CIO talking to us. And, and I didn't even know enough at the time to understand like to even question that it was like, you know, like we're off on customer visits. We're here to gain the real wisdom, you know? Mm. And what this, what this customer was telling us was that, you know, they didn't behind the scenes, they were probably doing Franken table cubes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like they didn't, they didn't fundamentally, even back then, this big, huge adopter of analysis services didn't really understand dimensional modeling. Uh, but, you know, I was still, completely green in this space at the time. And I had no idea. So I'm just like diligently taking notes, like maybe one cube per report is the right way. <laughs> so, in, in, so when was it that you really started thinking, okay, this power pivoting is going to revolutionize things? Was it immediately or yeah. is, 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 after a while you started blogging too and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I didn't intend to have a, uh, power pivot or power BI consulting career. Like that wasn't, you know, that wasn't like a, um, you know, I wasn't like working on the power pivot team going, Oh yeah. Like this is, this is going to change the world and we're going to need all of this and do all these cultural changes and everything. I, I didn't, I didn't see all of that. Um, and, uh, in fact, like 
honestly, like, um, I had become a bit of a cynic by this point in my, you know, a little bit jaded anyway, mm. uh, by this point in my Microsoft career, like, you know, like we would, we would work on a product and we'd have these gigantic ambitions for it. Like we're going to change the world and everyone's going to be using this and blah, blah, blah. And then, then you get to the reality of like, uh, it wasn't quite as good as we thought it was going to be. And the world was more complicated than we thought. And so like the, the response would be muted or at least delayed. Like it might, if you had a winner, you wouldn't know until like three years later. This is something that we talked about uh, with Brian Jones on our podcast as well. It's yeah. like even your victories back then were on like this three year delayed reaction, by which point you weren't even paying attention anymore and it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have helped you feel better. So I wasn't expecting this thing to be that good, mm. honestly. You know, I mean, I was expecting it to be good, but I wasn't expecting it to be like, um, and, uh, you know, full disclosure, I started blogging about Power Pivot. Um, basically out of necessity because a, 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 a big time change in my family situation led to me having to relocate across the country. And so for my final year at Microsoft, I was working remotely. And, you know, it's funny, like today, uh, you can work remotely for a software company. I mean, you know, COVID has really straightened this out for us, but, oh, yeah. but even before COVID, there was, a, there was a lot more acceptance of the idea that people could work remotely. Um, but in 2009, when this was going down for me, uh, when the, the, the chaos came to my family, right? Um, no, that didn't happen, especially not program managers. So I knew that my days working for Microsoft were numbered. And so I started the blog, Power Pivot Pro, and Power Pivot Pro referred to me. That was just, you know, it was just like a- yeah, like my avatar, essentially, right? And the whole point was, the whole point of Power Perfect Pro originally was just to get myself a bit of a, like a public resume so I could get a job outside of Microsoft when eventually that had to come to an end. That was the whole goal. And again, the jaded cynic in me sat down, was like, okay, so now I've got a blog about this, this Power Pivot thing. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do with it? And I said, oh, I know. Because the whole point of Power Pivot was supposed to be that an Excel user, an Excel power user such as myself, could build a cube. Mm. That was, you know, like a, a self-service business user driven cube, right? And so I'm like, well, I've had some experience building a, a cube the old way with a, an external consultant. It was that football cube that we did over on MSN. Yeah. So that'll be my blog. My blog will be the journey of re-implementing that football cube using power pivot instead of using the traditional analysis services. And I just knew this wasn't going to work. Right? I mean, version one of a tool that was aimed at someone like me, as opposed to someone that could learn MDX, like, yeah, yeah. like I was just thinking to myself, okay, I hope it just doesn't suck that bad. You know, like, I mean, I, I just sort of threw myself into this ballistically knowing full well that at some point, like around, I don't know, month three or whatever, I was going to have to start covering for, you know, and sort of like subtly sort of dodging all of the warts and all the things that had been missed and all the things that just didn't work quite right. Like I knew this was going to happen, you know, and it didn't, <laughs> it just, just never did. And at some point, like, and I do remember there was like, like one night where this happened. Like I realized that, you know, again, my expectation was maybe the result I could get with this tool would be 50% yeah, yeah. as good as what we did with the real consultant and the real MDX and all that kind of stuff back in the day. I was thinking like, if we can get 50% as good, I'll feel good about this project, right? And it was so many times better Mm. Like, it was, I, I mean, I remember you reading the blog then and seeing you at sessions then. You were very enthusiastic about it. Yeah. And, and I had never been enthusiastic. Like, I mean, I was sort of like forever known at Microsoft as sort of like the guy that was a little bit like cavalier about it all, right? Like, you know, like, yeah, we're going to do our best, you know, it's, we're going to do our best, but we all know it's not going to be very good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and everyone would laugh and everything. And, uh, but I became like this, like I went from being like a long time skeptic of all software to like this most like just crazy, like religious evangelist of this thing. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Because it was mind blowingly good. I just was, it was like in spite of uh, my involvement with it that I was so stinking impressed. Like it just, um, like I wrote a formula in the early going for this, you know, power pivot model, which was exactly accidentally the first measure. It was the first measure I built in the power pivot model. And it was the first measure we had built uh, back in like 2007 when I would, when I'd hired the consulting firm to write the MDX for me. Right. And it was the simplest formula and it doesn't matter if you know football or not, doesn't American football. It was just the, the, the measure is rushing yards. It's the most simple measure to write. Uh, and I remember the process of getting that measure right back in the day being like a couple of weeks. Um, and I was done with it in like, I don't know, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes yeah. in, in power pivot. And I mean, it was just like, where did that go? Where did all that time go? And, um, but that was like, I was like, I was up late. It was like two 30 in the morning. I'm sitting in my, in my home office. And I just like sit back in my chair and, and just like let out this low whistle, like, and it like, Oh, <laughs> like this is unreal. And it was, it was a legitimate, it wasn't an accident. It was a legitimate savings. Um, because I think the, and the key was, and it took me a long time to figure this out, but the key was, is that I was the stakeholder. I was the subject matter expert. I was the business sponsor essentially of this football thing. But now I was, and I had been before, but now I was also the, the implementer. I was the developer at the same time. And having those two things in the same brain squeezed out so much communication, so much iteration, so much misunderstanding. And because the, really when you get down to it, the DAX language isn't, I mean, it's amazing, but it's not like technically more complete or better or anything like that than MDX. Oh yeah. It's just that, it's just that I was able to learn DAX and I wasn't able to learn MDX. And, and that's also, that's when it dawned on me why Excel was so valuable. I had never understood that either. Like this lesson taught me everything, right? Having completed the circuit, like, of course, the reason Excel is so valuable and the reason it's so resilient and resistant to being stamped out as a, as like a quote unquote BI tool, right? Yeah. Is that the business stakeholders know it and they also know the business and IT doesn't, they don't, they don't know the business. And I was really lucky that the IT consultant that we'd hired back in the day on 2007, that football project at Microsoft, uh, wasn't from the United States and had never seen a game of American football in his life. Right. So he was very, very good. Technically, I still have enormous respect for this guy to this day. Um, he's really, really, you know, kind and, and clear human. And there was nothing wrong with him at all. He just didn't know the subject matter. And that's why that formula took a week or two weeks or whatever it took. Um, and it really like, it's almost like in a single night, the whole mission of my blog in my head changed. It changed from being, being my resume, my outside Microsoft resume to being the beginning of, you know, like planting the seeds for a new kind of consulting firm mm. because I knew that this pace that I had discovered was basically incompatible with the old consulting model and that we were going to need a new kind of firm that was organized differently, staffed differently, that, that had a completely different business model um, because the, the, the price of a project and the elapsed time of a project was going to drop dramatically. And on the good news side, though, the number of projects was also going to increase like exactly. just, yeah. just like through the roof. And so there wasn't going to be any end of work to do. But um, but the traditional business model in this space relies on those huge projects, the ones yeah. that grind and take forever, you know, and um, and having known some of those firms and having hired one of them, right? I knew that that the way that they were, their entire DNA was going to be incompatible with this style of operation. And so, you know, then it became like a really interesting intellectual challenge, right? Like, yeah. what is that? 
what does that new firm look like? Um, and it also hit me that this was like the only time in my life, probably that I was going to get some sort of like insider advanced knowledge about, a, the, you know, a change, a new, a new trend, a disruptive change in a multi-billion dollar industry. I was never going to get that sort of shot again. And so this was, this was the, this was the shot. And so that's, that's where the, the road turned, you know, like yeah. very we'll 90 degrees, you know? Yeah. Yeah, sent us down the road to uh, to P three Adaptive today. Yeah, so you did, especially in the beginning, you did also a lot of training, right? Which also is mm -hmm. pretty amazing. I can imagine, especially if you're like really feeling the waters, you should meet. Yeah, like I know, remember, yeah. and you were on the road all the time and everywhere and talking all these yep. classes. I actually attended one of your classes uh, once. That's right. That's right. In the yeah. Beginning. So um, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, I taught you everything. You know, just kidding. Uh, you taught me, in fact, you were actually a, <laughs> you were, because you were one of the, you know, the, the handful of the early followers of the blog, um, you were, you were very, very helpful to me in discovering DAX mistakes that I was making, mm. right? Like, I remember a couple of them. One of them in particular was, because um, remember, I, I had left the, the mothership and I'd moved across the country before DAX had even really been like like released in the internal builds. Like it wasn't, you know, so oh, I, yeah. I was learning DAX as an outsider. I remember there was one formula, right? That I was writing, which a measure, which was like sales per day. And I was doing a count rows. Um, I was doing a count rows of the calendar table for the denominator, but I didn't, I didn't have, um, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I didn't have the calendar table, um, like on the, on the pivot, on the report, it was another dimension table. Like I forget, I think it was like, oh yeah, it was temperature, right? It was the temperature and it was, but that was linked straight to the fact table. And I, I didn't unknowingly, I was dividing by the grand total of days in the calendar table every single time because the filter wasn't flowing back uphill. Yeah. Right. And, you know, uh, but the number was different everywhere, right? Because the, and it was fake data. So you really couldn't like intuit that it was wrong because, you know, who knows with fake data, right? And uh, so, yeah, you, you were the one that with a comment very gently came back and said, you know, I'm not getting, I don't think it's right. I don't think this is right. You know, so like, you know, it's, uh, and that was like really early in 2010. And Probably I'm like, 2009, yeah. Yeah. And so I had to, I had to go back and look at it and go, oh yeah, mea culpa and write a, write a correction blog post and everything. And, and, you know, that's when I discovered, you know, that, uh, that relationships were a one-way flow. Um, yes. so, you know, it's totally a joke for me to say that, you know, you attended my classes, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, yeah, I, I did do a lot of trainings, but it, you know, it's funny. Like the first, the first training client, um, wasn't until, uh, like October, 2010, that was the first time that someone sort of like out of the blue kind of hired me off of the internet. Um, in the interim, I had been, uh, sort of like borderline full-time hired, um, by another company that had decided to bet on this new technology. And so really, I think looking back, they were my first client is the company that I was nominally CTO of for a while, but they didn't take all of my time. Um, so I continued to develop things like the blog and, you know, eventually I ended up writing the book, the first version of my book while I was still nominally CTO at this company, you know? Um, and, uh, but the sort of that, that other consulting work, um, that, that didn't actually pick up until uh, late 2010, but you know, once it did pick up, yeah, for a while there, I was just flying all over the place all the time. I was just, I was like, I was hardly ever home. It was crazy. Makes sense. So, so let's talk about your company mm -hmm. about where you are today. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's interesting when I hear your podcast and I'm seeing some of your things on, online too, uh, some of the, the, the nice marketing guys you put out. It is definitely not a traditional consulting group because 
I, I know you really well. You kind of always say like, okay, like the, the traditional big business and the BI projects is not, don't come to me for that stuff. We do things differently because we really believe, and we've had this, a lot of these discussions. I mean, part of what you were saying in the early days about self-service BI, because I was a traditional BI developer, it yep. really got me like, this is why I'm enthusiastic about Power BI. This is why I wanted to pick up my stuff and move from Netherlands to the US, <laughs> work on this yeah. stuff. So I, I also have you to blame for that. So, but, uh, <laughs> no, but it, it's there, definitely enthusiastic. So, so how did you bring that into your consulting firm or company that you started? Yeah, so I think, you know, it, it, we can start at that initial realization, right? That, um, and I had a lot of clarity from the beginning, at least at the high level. Um, the details were apparently, I, I discovered later that the details were definitely not clear to me. <laughs> uh, and I didn't know how, how much detail was going to be required to get this thing to its current state. But um, at a high level, you know, if we go back to that thing from before, like, the old business model was a small number of very slow, expensive projects per year. Yeah. And the new model was going to be a large number of, you know, faster, lower price tag projects per year. So that was the, you know, that was the, the, the one sort of like key insight that has very much remained, you know, sort of consistent and at our core. Uh, from the very beginning, um, you know, and I don't, I don't think that the old model was in some sense, um, it's not like the old model was dishonest, mm -hmm. you know, the, the old model was the only model that worked. I mean, if you have to, have to use SIS to get data from yeah. one place to the yeah. other, I mean, it is hard yeah. and it's tough and yeah. there's lots of things. Now you just whip yep. open Power BI, Power Query, That's boom. Right. That's right. Yeah, like a really key difference is is that um, with the old tools, SSAS, tap, um, sorry, SSAS uh, multidimensional and old school SSIS, right? Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't keep the business user's attention, the business sponsor's attention while you did anything. Like you, you couldn't operate synchronously. You couldn't have them in the room while you wrote the formula because it took whatever you were doing always took too long. You know, maybe not like a really long time, but like 30 minutes is a long time for someone just to sit there staring at you, you know? Yes. Um, and if you have to reprocess the cube, I mean, heaven help you, right? So, so it was always this asynchronous disconnected model where you, you built the requirements document. Like you, you were trying to be respectful of the business, business's time, you know? Like yeah. let's let's brain drain you into this document. So then we will take the document and execute over here in the dark, right? And the software, I completely agree. The software at the time dictated that model of operation. Now, it turns out to be a terribly inefficient and broken means of operating. It's just the only way that worked. <laughs> and worked is even worked, it never really worked. But it was the only choice. Um, it was the only choice, and it didn't really work. Um, and so, um, you know, we said, okay, look, it's sort of like our, our original, you know, religious credo. It's like we're going to move as fast as the technology allows. We're never going to do anything. We're never going to recommend anything to a client that would be that would be good for us, but not good for them. You know, mm -hmm. and and that drives almost like every decision after that, like almost everything in our evolution is driven by that commitment. And so it's really interesting, right? Like like uh, when you lean into that model, because we didn't you know, it was actually very quickly that we we got out of doing just training. Like we ended up even when it was still just me, um, like my wife was the back office and I was the front office. <laughs> You know, yeah, like that was the, that was the business for a while. Um, even if it was just me, I ended up getting into all kinds of implementations. Uh, you know, even though I, I, I sort of thought of myself at the beginning as like, I'll be a trainer. I ended up getting into implementations almost immediately. And they ended up being a lot more satisfying even than the training. Like, because you could just 
build these things so fast. It changed people's lives and changed, changed the entire trajectory of entire companies in such a, in such short order. It was crazy. And, um, so, you know, it, it proved to work that that pace worked. Like it, it didn't result in, and again, this was unknown at the time. It was like sort of like exploring space or the, the ocean or something, you know, like, like it turned out that the results that you could turn out with this methodology in the real world were every bit as good as I suspected they could be. Right. But like still had to go see it. Right. It had to, had to work. And so like, it was just, just getting these amazing wins under our belt. And so like, you know, it's a business model that is insanely good for the customer. Yeah. Like just amazingly good for the customer. But did you um, find, did you find that everyone is ready for these things? Because Okay. So, you know, the, um, I don't know if it's a book or if it's a concept within a book, it's uh, crossing the chasm mm -hmm. that uh, I read this years later after sort of, you know, the, the business had matured through a number of phases and, and I was reading this book going, oh my God, this is like in retrospect, describing the evolution of our company and our customers like to a T. Um, in the beginning, there were like almost all of our customers in the beginning, all of our clients in the beginning were just crazy visionary, you know, like, um, I, I, I talked to some of them, you know, you know, from time to time, even all these years later. And I just laugh and say like to them, like, you know, you're, you were just nuts. Like, you were right. You were right to take a risk on this stuff, you know? But I mean, having not had my background and not had my particular career path, how the heck could you have decided that this was worth a look, right? Like I'm just blown away. So the early adopters and, and the, the crossing the chasm thing describes this perfectly. Like it, I think it says something like, the early adopters of anything new are typically revolutionaries. They're looking for revolution. And at one point in time, the tagline on our website used to be leading the data revolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and I, yes. you know, and I didn't. So, so that's how I viewed myself as the revolutionary, right? <laughs> and the no surprise, again, looking back, the people we had were crazy revolutionaries as well. Those were our customers. And, you know, it turned out that I was really the, you know, Power Pivot Pro was really the only show in town at the time. Like, you yep. know, so, but I think that like these people are exceedingly rare, these crazy early people, you know? Mm -hmm. And in terms of absolute numbers, there just still weren't that many of them in the world that were willing to take a gamble on this back in like, even like in 2013. Um, which is when I finally sort of cut loose from my first ongoing client where I was CTO and just, just leaned into the, what had been the side business at that point, like leaned into yeah. it full time. Like that's 2013 was when I made that transition. Even then the people that were hiring me in hindsight were just, just crazy. Either I mean, just crazy still foresight. talking about days where it's power pivot V1 or RBI right. V1. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and we didn't even, and it wasn't, we didn't even have power query yet. Like it's crazy, right? All we had was DAX and, and, and the, the Vertipak engine, and it was still only in Excel. And, um, but you know, you run out of these people, you know, these crazy visionary revolutionaries, right? Uh, there's a finite supply of them in the world. And so, um, so it was a, a really weird situation where, and I was still like, you know, like we had Chris Webb on, on my podcast, right? Like, and, you know, he and I used to, you know, behind the scenes, uh, and it wasn't just him, there was a number of people, right? Like I had a lot of sort of ongoing, usually polite arguments with the traditional BI crowd where I was saying, look, this is, that model's going away, you know, and, it, and this new model is coming. Yes. And, and then I was getting this confirmation from the real world in the form of these clients where we were doing things that, I mean, like we were literally doing things like reversing the decline of a publicly traded company's share price and sending it back up, you know? And at the time it was still, everyone was still trying to, to pigeonhole this stuff as like, oh, that's just like team BI. It's, it'll never handle like 
enterprise stuff and i'm just sitting there going like mm, i, think it's I don't just, know I, mean, I feel like at that time and even today you can still see it because i also work with uh, a lot of the customers today it's it departments being afraid of letting go but yeah now yeah. They, these days i mean you were really early but these days it's, it's an avalanche that they cannot stop that's right that's right yeah kind of like almost like the bring your own device you know, revolution that just exactly. like, they no, say, we're, well, we're all bringing our iPhones like it or not, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, so we, we did, you know, um, about the time, like 2015 is when, um, the amount of work coming in was too much for me to, uh, you know, to personally address. And that's when we made the decision to, you know, to finally, which, which I knew was coming eventually. That's when we made the decision to start scaling and, and hiring people. And, um, and around that time is when, it's sort of like the, you know, like we had SSAS tabular um, at that point. We obviously had Power Query. Um, you know, we had like the first version of Power BI, which wasn't, you know, there's nothing like we had to what we have today. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, we were getting into the more, you know, more clients that were like incremental, um, you know, incremental evolution is what they were looking for. And that's how the crossing the chasm describes this like you know how do you crossing the chasm describes how do you get from these crazy rabbit early adopters to the early majority with anything with any business at all right and so you know i mean this transition for our business obviously really just rides the coattails of microsoft's transition in this business it's not like you know our business went out there and did this for itself i mean like the this is our business followed along with the, the the overall global trends right yeah and um but even then in the um you know like in that 2015 era um you know most of our clients were either um like you know c-level leaders at mid-sized companies or departmental leaders at larger companies like 2015, like CIOs weren't coming to us. And again, in 2015, powerpivotpro.com, which is, is now p3adaptive.com, like you started, if you, if you did some sort of web search on, on these technologies, all roads still led to, to my blog at that point in time. Like I was, there was just really like a, a center of, of mass, which, you know, it, it, we're not even really like, you know, like our blog isn't really on that radar anymore uh, with, with the I explosion of blogs are on the radar anymore. No, that's true. It's like, oh yeah, everything's, everything's gone away. Right. So, yes. um, but, um, you know, even then when we were sort of the dominant, you know, sort of dominant force in the marketplace in terms of like where you would go, uh, you know, fortune 500 CIOs weren't beating our door down. That was definitely not happening. Uh, departmental leaders and, and then top level leaders at mid-sized companies, small and mid-sized companies. Um, you know, I slowly over time learned that they're, that they basically have, they basically operate very similarly. They have a departmental leader at a large company and like a CFO at a mid-sized company have similar needs, similar resources, similar budgets. Um, you might as well consider a, a department level at a big company to be a mid-sized company yeah, of its of own in a yeah. way. And, you know, those sorts of people comprised and still to this day comprise a, a very, very, you know, significant percentage of our clients. Yeah, um, that, because I we, think, we, I mean, to what, you meant, to what you mentioned before, I think a lot of the projects have gone from, okay, we need a corporate wide BI solution mm -hmm. to, okay, yep. our particular department has needs and let's get it fixed. And IT is now more into, okay, we need to help you get things that you be. We need to make sure everything is governed and secure, but we're not going to talk about the data anymore. You guys take care of that. Is that also yeah. what you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, we, you know, we, we are a Microsoft partner, so we work with, you know, the Microsoft field. And so that does get us into contact with, with CIOs and directors of IT and things like that that are sort of from the top down. And so, um, you know, those engagements are a little different, you know, like, you know, those engagements are, you know, usually of the form, how do we make the most of Power BI? You know, like it's sort of like after they've decided to buy it, after they've decided to commit to it, you know, how do we get the most out of that investment? Um, and then, you know, 
if you read between the lines, a lot of, a lot of it is also like, and how do we keep this under control in a way that's, you know, that's, yeah. uh, not going to cost us our jobs, you know? So what, so um, what do you answer? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, the, the, the questions of governance and adoption are really, in, you know, in our opinion, almost the same question, mm. you know, like there's, there's a lot of overlap in that, in that Venn diagram, at least. And, um, you know, like, um, well, let, let's, let's, let's go there, you know, let's, 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 let's dive in. So, um, the, the, like it has, if we go back to the old model, right. Which is where we're coming from. It was responsible for basically everything from end to end, like from, from the original data storage all the way through like the rendering of pixels uh, in, you know, on every surface that was going to be, you know, presenting data to the user. And, um, you know, the, the dirty secret is that those old BI tools, even when they were like deemed a success, really never were. Um, those old, those old tools just ended up being like the jumping off point for export to Excel. And, um, and those Excel spreadsheets that really ran the business, um, like those were sort of like good news and bad news below the radar of it. Yes. You know, like it didn't, didn't, didn't know what was in them in most cases, didn't even know that they existed. These, these sound, these sound like bad things, right? But at the same time, most of the time, IT wouldn't be blamed for or held responsible for something that went wrong in those spreadsheets. Like the business right. sort of like implicitly owned them. Um, you know, I mean, there are plenty of, you know, celebrated instances where a spreadsheet went wrong and then, you know, in the grand finger pointing game, it came back to IT somehow, but like, those are the exception. Like the, the overwhelming majority was, it was the business's solution to a problem. And it was also the business's problem. You know, it was up, it was up to them. Right. Um, and so when you're transitioning to something like power BI, well, first of all, like, you know, it's, it's got some infrastructure to it. It's got the word BI in it. Right. And so like IT correctly, I think deduces that this is something that if it goes wrong, they will be blamed for. Yeah. Unlike Excel, right? They don't get the Excel pass on this one, but if they roll it out wrong, it'll be just as unregulated <laughs> uh, as Excel. And it would be the, the world's most chaotic problem, just as chaotic as Excel maybe. And they're still responsible for it. And that's, that's, a, that's terrifying, right? And I think it's, it's wisdom, you know, that IT sort of, you know, has this, 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 this fear. So what um, do you see mostly when you talk about governance? Like well, the, I mean, what, what do they care about? So, I mean, you know, that's, it's the usual things like, you know, certainly security and, and reuse, um, but you know, again, a lot of it comes back to, you know, when something goes wrong, you know, what's the process for addressing it? Um, and uh, there was something else that we wanted to, that I definitely want to talk about specifically in this space, which is, I think it, I think it, something that you wanted to talk about as well, which is, you know, data set reuse. Yeah, that's you know? a tying to Melissa's question. Uh, Melissa Coates asked the mm -hmm. question when I was listening. Yeah. Okay. So like self-service governance has changed over time. How much success does Rob see? Uh, and how do autos use shared data sets? And how does such reduce the data dupe? Easy self mm -hmm. IT, uh, slightly harder for the decentralized self-service owners. So, yeah. So, you know, like it's a, it's a natural way to ask the question, right? Are we seeing, you know, a shift in, uh, business users, you know, willingness to reuse sort of, you know, published and certified data sets, for example, right. And, you know, it depends upon where you connect with the particular organization, at what level are you most tightly connected? 
and this 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 will shift your opinion and your sort of your perspective on this question. You know, so it's a very IT centric type of question. You know, how do we get users to reuse certified data sets, right? And you know, and again, we we connect at that level at the IT level. You know, you know, some reasonable percentage of the time, but we're also spending a lot of time connected, like closer to the to the actual application of it, closer to the actual usage of it. And so, I mean, everyone um, has ingrained I, single version of the truth. Yes, yes. And so, like, I'd like to like to kind of like recast that question because mm -hmm. um, it you know, at, on the face of it, it almost sounds like like what's the trend, you know, in the same way that we had like um, a reluctance to adopt the cloud for a long time in BI. Like it's hard to even remember that now, isn't it? Right. Like that's, exactly, that's yeah. just, that's just gone. Right. And so that was a change in attitude, a change in attitude uh, allowed the cloud to become part of BI, whereas it was sort of like kryptonite, you know, back in 2015, for some reason. Um, this one isn't like that. Uh, reuse and adoption of, of, you know, published certified data sets isn't, isn't a shift in attitudes type of problem. And it's never going to be an attitude shift that, so let's, let's recast the question as, you know, how do we foster, how do we get there? How do we foster the reuse of data sets? And so, you know, the way I would start with this, and you know, I want to offer a bit of a disclaimer, which is that like, you know, I'm now, you know, quite a bit removed from the real time of all of this playing out with our clients. Um, you know, we have a big team now and, um, you know, like in some ways, like I almost like have like, you know, like 30 of them sitting around me here, like answering this question for me. But, but I do get sort of, um, you know, sort of the, the more slowly evolving picture. Um, which is oftentimes just as valuable. So that's the that's that's the perspective I'm going to bring here. Like, imagine for a moment that you've got a data set, you know, a data model um, that has been built by a particular department. You know, like the, imagine there's like a finance department, like it's like the CFO's office or whatever, and there's mm -hmm. someone in that department that's built this data set. Okay, like the chances that that data set, if it gets, you know certified or whatever, whether it's formally certified or it's just sort of like informally, that's the one to use. The chances that that one's going to get reused rather than like duplicated are reasonably high. Mm. You know, it's reasonably high that within that department, that model is going to be like the model. You know, now, of course, the person who built it might then also go build another model that it that like shares one of the fact tables, something like that. And then it, it's a bit of a like a 50 50 toss up as to whether that should have been one model or two. But that, that's really blurry, you know. So like th the question is, uh, I think it's better to say like this one model, will it be used by others? And the answer is going to be yes in that situation. Because it was, it was two things really important. Number one, it was built very, very, very close to the stakeholders. You know, it was, yeah. in fact, it was built by, it was built by one of the stakeholders, right? And that stakeholder is embedded amongst the rest of the stakeholders. Okay, so it was built very close to the business requirements, very close to the subject matter experts. And the second thing is, is that it's never done. Mm -hmm. You know, as the... Yes. As, the, as new needs, new desires, new conditions emerge, that thing's going to evolve in real time in parallel, right? This is the key. And I think, you know, if we go back to attaching at the sort of like more like at the IT director level or the CIO level, it's very easy to get to sort of like subtly still remain in portions of the old mindset. Like IT tends to think of these things. If, uh, so. Like IT thinks, hey, we'll go build a data set and get the business to use it. You know, like that's that's their first instinct. Yes. And so right off the bat, we're going to be building it at a distance from the stakeholders. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be that way, right? You you even if IT is building it, they could go get really, really, really close to the stakeholders mm -hmm. because again, like I said earlier, there's that synchronous building that you can do. Yes. You don't grab everybody in the business and 
have them sit in a conference room while you're while you're writing formulas, but you grab one or two of them, you know, uh, and um, and you and you don't and don't bother with the requirements doc, right? Like the the yeah, live interaction and and is do, and just doing it is so much better. Uh, so so you know, but again, the default instinct is to build at a distance. So you got to overcome that. Mm. Build close, you know, build close. And then understand that that thing is not ever done. Like if, if you get back to the point, if you, if you sort of like close the books on this project, say, this is the data set, da da, and you view it as this monolith, like you're going to lose it because like 24 hours later, it's already missing a measure that it needed. Yeah. You know? And you know, the old, the old, like, I forget what the stat was, but it's like nine business days back in the old days to add a single column to a single existing report. If you get into that sort of methodology and expectation with every incremental evolution of a, of a certified data set, that certified data set is, 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 you know, it's atrophying. Yeah. Uh, it, it can't be that way. And now I have even been part of uh, IT driven projects that built a data model that was rapidly adopted by the business. And, and this is even back in like 2014 with SSAS tabular. Um, I can't name the client, obviously, but they're a huge company. It was a multi billion row model. Mm -hmm. uh, every dollar that had ever gone in or out of this entire gigantic enterprise uh, over the course of decades was modeled in this thing. It's like their whole business, which is insane. Um, and uh, it was it was an IT sponsored project, um, but it was it was iterative. Mm -hmm. We we. We, we the the IT team that, that sponsored it was actually already like intrinsically very close to the business. They understood the business uncommonly well. Um, and it's because they had a one-to-one -one relationship. This particular IT team, which was a big IT team, had exactly one business team that they supported. And, and so that allowed them to be a lot closer. And, and then we brought the actual, like we, we brought like an ambassador from that business in and got their you know feedback on it uh and then after it was done there was a period of like kicking the tires and and realizing that it wasn't done and then an equal amount of investment made again in improving it in some dramatic ways oh, wow. like re-architecting it in some dramatic ways um in a, in a second round of engagement that actually truly made it fit the business's needs and then lastly, <laughs> along the way, this IT team acquired, you know, through us, um, the skill and the knowledge to understand how their model works. And someone on their team was able to uh, continue the evolution of it. Mm. So if you, that'd be my advice, right? Is those two number, those, those two really important things. First of all, you build it close to the business. You know, that might mean the business builds it too, yeah, right? Yeah. In some cases, but either way you build it close to the business and then you accept the fact that someone has to be capable, not of maintenance. Maintenance is the wrong way to look at it. Someone has to be capable of continuing the evolution of it. You have to allocate those resources. Um, and you know, it's so like, I would view like adoption and reuse of shared data sets to be much more of a, of a pull problem than a push. You can't mm -hmm. push. One of, yeah. one of my favorite analogies is pushing on a rope, right? Like forcing adoption of shared data sets is pushing on a rope. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, you, need to um, want you have to make those. Yeah. You have to make them want it. You have to make them. It's you have to make that data set the path of least resistance for them answering their questions. And that's hard, you know, and that's why I see the world and we, we at P3, we, we, we see the world of you know, this new world as more like a, a, a federated hub and spoke model where 
like there is there there needs to be one of the overall themes that just keeps coming up on our podcast is this the the notion of the ambassador the the hybrid the tweener you know it's either an IT person who knows an uncommon amount of the business <laughs> or the business person who's able to learn things like DAX and M yeah the guy who and, installs Barbie desktop on his laptop and just goes that's right that's right yeah and so um you know and I I think I'm you know, I, I'm more an example of the business person who, who who learned DAX and M than I am of the IT person who learned the business. Um, so um, I don't know. I guess that's a there's there's aspects of both of those in me. I guess, but um, anyway, um, yeah, I I think it's a human problem. You know, and and like so many human problems, um, when you're when you're looking at it through an IT lens, the human problem starts to masquerade as a technology problem. And that's when you, when you, uh, when you lose your way. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, so we kind of talked about this IT governance side of things, but let's do last question. Let's do one more flip around and let's look okay. at, okay, so I'm a business user. I'm an Excel user mm -hmm. sitting inside of some big organization and crunching numbers and I'm copying things around free lookups everywhere. What would you recommend them? What would, you, what would you tell them? So, um, like, I mean, this is where, this is really like the first place that, you know, I ever became sort of commercially active. Yeah. You know, was with these people, you know, yeah. the, the first, first handful of our, of our clients were, you know, um, typically business leaders uh rather than it leaders and they were people who were already good at excel and had heard about this new you know industrial strength version of excel and that that piqued their interest you know so um and you know this is the future you know the first thing um uh, the first thing i would say to those people is has nothing to do with the technology it has everything to do with like the, again, the human plane, which is like you very well, you Excel user about to, you know, start dipping your toe into Power BI. You're the future of data, uh, much more so than any, you know, um, data engineering, Python, whatever type of person or, or IT person. Don't the, let Thomas hear the, this. The person, what's that? Don't hear, let Thomas LaRock hear this. Oh, I know. I know. He hears it from me all the time on our, <laughs> our podcast, yeah. you know, uh, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's uh, kicking the tires of M. I think, I think power query is really going to speak to him. Um, so, um, so yeah, your the, the future is yours. If you choose to, if you choose to seize it, like, uh, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to, um, advance your career in a, in a step change way. So that's, you know, let's get the, let's get the excitement and the ambition. Um, you know, let's get that going first. <laughs> it's the, is first and foremost, you should be excited. Like mm -hmm. I used to say this all the time. If, if I could learn this stuff and I, I learned very few technologies in my time at Microsoft, I was never all that into programming. You know, I just, I was miscast as a, you know, as a programmer, like in college and stuff, like I just I've never been into this stuff. Um, and, um, so you can do it. First of all, you can absolutely do it and it's going to be amazing for you. So that's, that, let, let's set the hook there. Um, I, again, going back to something I said earlier, like, um, I would, I would try not to, um, like, so if you start, if you start, you know, just like reading blogs and, or watching, you know, YouTube videos and things like that, like, uh, it's possible, you know, some percentage of the audience, like the Excel crowd that's, that, that goes through that process immediately takes to it. They're like, oh my gosh, this speaks to me. Like, and it's just like, boom, off they go. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you're not one of those people that's boom, off you go. The thing I would say to you then is, is like, go back to that thing I was saying earlier. Like th there's so much like high end technical expertise that's been brought to bear in this space, in the community, that it's intimidating. Mm. And it's, it doesn't have to be that way. Like, 
um, like, you know, honestly, like, like the only things that I know work for onboarding in this space are the things that like, you know, that we've developed, right? I mean, like, this isn't, this isn't like some commercialism. We don't make that much money off of training anymore. We, we never made that much money off of our book, right? Like you don't, you just, it's not, a, these aren't major revenue sources for us at all. Like we're, we're far more uh, into, you know, into project implementation and, 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 you know, and sort of like organization wide adoption and things like that. That's what, that's where we do most of our work these days. But like, um, if you're like the V look up and pivot crowd, uh, I mean, I, I wrote my book for you. Mm. Um, and I think a, a lot of people have like, for example, read my book, got, and that got them to like my level on this stuff. And then they've gone on to become the other level that, that, that other thing that they, they go on to a point where they're writing formulas that I look at and go, Oh yeah, that's the DAX that I don't understand. <laughs> you know, that's that dialect that is foreign to me, you know? Um, and, uh, but like that, like that gentle onboarding, like that's the way we do it. Like if you take one of our classes, we're going to be speaking to you. If you read our book, we're going to be speaking to you. Um, if you, if you start reading like, you know, like the really high end DAX formulas and they, they make sense to you, Hey, more power to you. Like that's, and honestly, Casper, like even the majority of people who work for our company now, like when they write DAX, I look at it and it's that dialect. It's that, yeah, it's that yeah. crazy, unbelievably, like, I don't, I don't get it. Like I am the worst person at DAX now at, at this company, you know, like there are, there are like probably 30 plus people at this company who are better at DAX than I am. Um, and that's great. <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, so seek out the gentle onboarding. Um, you, you can be bad at this stuff and, and still be incredibly effective. Um, and so yeah, your I first, mean, uh, your first goal is to go be bad. I, I think well, one of the things that was really revolutionary for me too, is really when you see they don't have to spend all this time on doing the same repetitive business. You have time to yeah, do other stuff. That's right. Look at the that's amazing right. stuff that's that you now yeah. are is able to do. I, yeah. That was really the time with Power Pivot all the way in the beginning that I saw and was doing in the in the business that I was at that time. I was thinking, yeah. you see these people's eye lit up. They say, oh, now I don't have to do this shit anymore. I can focus yeah. on actually yeah. looking at stuff differently. Yeah, it's you you become a happier person which is not what you typically expect from software right like you know normally we talk about productivity gains and roi and all of that and this this stuff delivers power bi delivers all of that you know it, by the truckload yeah um and yet that misses something really important like the the human beings that 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 take to this stuff become, they go from being some of the most sort of like, I don't know, almost like underappreciated and sort of like dissatisfied to some of the you know most energetic and happy people that you'll ever meet. And that transition, even if there was never like a monetary figure attached to their career that, that went up, you know, uh, and that usually also happens if, if, mm -hmm. uh, if you're in the right place anyway. Um, but the happy, oh my gosh, it just, just becomes so much more satisfied uh, because all of your human interactions get better. Like your job doesn't suck anymore. <laughs> it's like, it's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, I think Rob, we're out of time. I think we already went over time, um, but- uh, uh, That's fine. That's fine. We, we always do that to our, you know, with our show as well. Yeah, you're definitely <laughs> so. longer than me usually, but uh, I will definitely put the links to your uh, podcast uh, and the blogs and everything in the descriptions below for people to listen to it. I would def definitely right. recommend it. I always listen. I'm also a bit biased because they're all old friends from both of us. Yeah. Uh, it's always yeah. nice to, to hear. It's been just amazing watching the community explode around this stuff. Um, and yeah. uh, exactly. Well, thank you for your time and I'll talk to you next time. All Thanks, right. Rob. Hey, my first ever, my first ever video podcast. So, you know, I, you know, I appreciate the experience. It's cool. It looks amazing. So, oh, you know, it's just my office. <laughs> you know, not really. It's a future project. TBD. We'll 
details to details to come. Yeah, we'll definitely follow that. All right. Thank All you. Right. Thanks, Casper. And that wraps up another episode of Cast from BI. Stay tuned for more content. Subscribe here. Go to Spotify. Uh, go to Apple. All of these episodes are also broadcasted as podcasts. Um, if you're not already following Rob's own materials, his own podcast, his blog, uh, his organization, his company, please do so. Uh, I can't imagine that you're not following Rob, but but please do. Um, yeah, with that, I'm looking forward to seeing you next time.